generation of preachers and expositors that are being raised up in this hour, I can think of no greater example. Now, I do not, <clears throat> I do not want you to get sick, but you're going to hear some of the most vile. You know, if I set this up the way it is, it's going to, it's going to lean toward like you think I'm attacking these men. But I want you to understand something. What you're about to hear in these clips should make you sick to your stomach. And if you're not, you might want to question exactly who it is that you trust in God. I am sick to my stomach. I wish I was joking about that, but I'm not. To hear John Calvin, the way that they say it, the prophets and the apostles, they got nothing on him. But don't take my word for it. Let's listen to the worship of John Calvin. Then we're going to have some biblical truth added in to show you why this is happening. Buckle up. Then the great expositor himself, John Calvin, who preached some 4,000 expository sermons. He preached every Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, every day of the week, every other week. And this man so committed to the exposition of Scripture. His personal love as he came to his preaching, it's not simply that he gave the explanation in a, in a sterile way. He was a man who wanted to unveil the glory of God. That's what the problem was. Because I heard him first. I said, hold on. I said, hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Because then I start to taste him. I said, and then I start to smell them. So it's like a smell that tastes like other. He saw himself as a guardian of the glory of God. What and you just said himself... is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. A guardian of the glory of God. Surely no one else could feel this way, right? Surely there's not a man that could feel this kind of arrogant. I mean, there's nobody this ludicrous that could believe, and I'm talking about Mr. Lawson, he can't believe, he, got, he's, he can't be the only one that believes that John Calvin is, is there anybody else like John Calvin? Is there anybody else that, can, that we can find that has people preach so highly of him? I wonder where we can find such a person. With whom Jesus Christ called, and we learn through Joseph much, much more about Jesus long before Bethlehem and well beyond Calvary. Really? Whenever we speak of the prophet Joseph Smith, therefore, it should really? be in reverent appreciation of the Lord who called him really? and whom Joseph served so well. From Joseph Smith, one untrained and unlearned in theology, more printed pages of scripture have come down to us than from any other mortal. In Notice even Joseph Smith gets to have a hallmark moment of so many writings. It's not just exclusive to John Calvin. In fact, as President Holland has pointed out, more than the combined pages, at least now available, from Moses and Paul and Luke and Mormon have come to us through the prophet Joseph Smith. Celebrating works and deeds, John Calvin being celebrated for his works and deeds? Surely the works of Christ is greater than all things, right? You're getting tortured right now, and I'm sorry, but there's more. Because if you thought that what was said by Joseph Smith was bad, wait till you hear Albert Moeller. I hope you got your airplane barf bags. It gets worse. Is well to consider John Calvin as preacher and teacher is well 
to recognize a debt. We are deeply indebted to John Calvin. I told you it was pretty disgusting, but it gets worse. I'm sorry. At least a part of what we are doing as we are here is, is, is not, to, not to thank John Calvin, who is not here to be thanked, but to thank the living God who gave his church, John Calvin, and so many others, that was as those who have faithfully taught and reformed oh, no, his church. Right. It is also to be inspired by an example. I warned you. I warned you. This is the face of a cult. You just heard four men. Well, three men. Let me add a fourth in there, because you gotta give we gotta we gotta balance it, right? We gotta balance it. During this past year, which of them do you consider to be the greatest? His answer is most startling. He said, you have only had one truly great American, one man who gave to the world ideas that could change the whole destiny of the human race. Stop it. Joseph Get Smith, some help. The Mormon prophet. I regret very much that I did not retain that newspaper nor can I remember the name of the Russian gentleman. But as I look in your faces here this morning and realize that you are here and I am here, all because of one great man, Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, and when I are realize you getting the that picture there are yet? some two million of us over the world who are you seeing his memory, what Romans by the end of the chapter century, one will be some ten 18. million. Who who 23 is talking about. Are you getting it yet? I begin to see something of what the outsiders It doesn't get saw better than this. In this it great gets America. Far worse. What is it about the wisdom of men? What is it about the wisdom of men that is more sought after than God? I just don't understand. I had a young man ask me tonight in your own words Eric tell me why you think theology is bad not the proven evidence of the Bible he wanted to hear from me personally like my opinions actually matter over God's when I said that I have no business giving an opinion on God I was called upon upon because I want God to speak for himself because I prefer not to deal in my own opinion so I don't partake in what theologians and he is one and let's face it everyone's a theologian that's because everybody's a sinner the only theologians that never existed on this earth are dead ones that never existed it's the only way they could never have exist in order for them not to be a theologian because everybody has an idea of god everybody has a speculation of god everybody has an imagination of god but it's so much easier for us and we are prone to going into idolatry which is building our own god when you build your own god you can build your own theology that's why you hear the reverence the sheer glee that they pour over John Calvin because he created a God they can identify with. Who's they? Well, 2 Timothy 4.3 talks about them. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure, sound, and wholesome instruction, but having ears itching for something that's pleasing and gratifying they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and foster the errors that they hold that is 100 percent reformed theology and all theology you heard joseph smith being worshiped 
And I can go on and on and on. There is a man or woman that will want to glorify another person that they revere that preaches and teaches what makes their soul happy. And Paul calls that confidence in the flesh. It's confidence in the flesh, plain and simple. Because a time will come when some will no longer tolerate sound teaching. Instead, they will live by their own desires. They'll scratch their itching ears by surrounding themselves with teachers who approve of their lifestyle. What lifestyle is that? You see, it's easy to point fingers at Joel Osteen and the Stephen Furtick's and the Benny Hens. Reformed theology and other so-called intellectuals love to point fingers at them. But this passage ain't about them. This passage is about everyone who wants to have their errors supported. Now, about this time, you're going to see some images put up on the screen. And what you're going to see is a conversation I had with a young man that's at Ligonier. Because, you know, you can reach out to them and discuss their theology with them. But they're not interested in biblical truth. I have asked countless times, countless times, different young men, God bless them, they're so indoctrinated, they cannot answer the very questions that I keep asking. Young man, you can see it for yourself right here on screen. Over and over and over. Is Reformed theology accurate and right? Is the Reformed theology the right theology to have? Well, let's read some of these. And I'm also looking to read them myself because they have to be. You're not going No one believes this until it's actually heard specifically. No one likes to see these things, but these things are as real and accurate as they come. So let's let me just read this a little bit. So, it's always, I always ask a simple question. Where do I go in the Old Testament to find out about the doctrine of election? Where is it taught from Moses to the prophets all the way down to the New Testament? Do you know what the prevailing answer is going to be? You see it on your screen. It's pretty simple stuff. So, Whenever the Old Testament, this is from young man, a young man. Whenever the Old Testament speaks about God choosing or calling, that's an example of God's sovereign election. Okay. God's call to Abraham in Genesis 12 would be one example. No. Actually, what happened there was God called out Abram. And told him that he would and renamed him Abraham. So that way God took control of him completely. That was his man now. And from Abraham would a nation come. That, that's it. And he created a people that did not exist on the earth at the time when he called Abram. And then we all know that the Israelites came from Abraham. A people of God's own choosing, the Israelites, and that has never changed. It hasn't transferred, it hasn't done anything. Those people are the elect because they've been chosen out. How did he choose? He made them. They didn't exist before. You remember Hebrews? He called things that weren't into existence to where now those things are now. Yeah, he did that. They didn't exist before. Now they exist. The greatest evidence of God on this earth, and it is designed to be this way, is the Israelites. A people that can trace their lineage back to Abraham. They can trace the line to Jesus. And that is by design of God. So the greatest asset to proof of God's existence, not only is in his word, 
but in the very people that he made that cannot be disputed. That genealogy cannot be called into question. One of the greatest gifts on this earth is God and his chosen people that we are now part of through Jesus. Which were once two people, the elect and the called. Peter names it that way. Ephesians names it that way. But see, they stop at Ephesians. They only can talk so much about Ephesians because then it'll rebuff them. It'll rebuke them, it'll refute them, and then it's all calamity. But see, it's real easy to try to hijack the Bible. Theolo theologians have been doing it for years. You just heard these men worshiping John Calvin as if he walked on water himself. You heard Steve Lawson say the greatest gift to the church is a sinner. Not the prophets, not the apostles, not Paul, not Paul, John Calvin. I mean, can you, do you see the man worship? It's almost, well, it ain't almost, it's cringy. It's cultish. That's exactly what Reformed theology is. I am not going to apologize for calling a spade a spade because they definitely don't apologize for calling those that are not elect. Well, you've been chosen by God to go to hell. They got no qualms with that. I got no qualms telling the truth. They are cults. They are a cult and they are fascinated with this fake gospel. They have literally made a God that has basically it's his responsibility to re make us repent for our sins. It, he took the responsibility of man, one of the gifts, one of the things that condemns us. They, he, they just took it away. Oh, God does everything for us. And they actually think that that gives a superiority to them. When the whole time God has been saying it is your responsibility to repent. That repentance doesn't come with power. It doesn't come with demand. Now that I repent to God, you have to save me. That doesn't exist. And they'll leverage that and say, well, that's exactly what you're saying if you can repent of your own. Yet we have a whole Bible of men repenting on their own. They, men can't repent of their own. Then, the, then you know what? The Levitical sacrifices and the rituals done, the scapegoats, you know, the burnt offerings, the sin offerings, the benevolence offerings, you know, the guilt offerings, the blood guilt. Do you realize that they shouldn't have been doing any of those things? But see, reform will tell you that that's the elect at that time, but then they'll steal it from the Israelites every other chance they get. That's why they're accused, because that, that accusation is true. They are a replacement theology. They have tried to replace the entire Bible by making sure the Old Testament can't be trusted. They'll use words like, well, it was hinted and, and woofed and warped around. What does that even mean? Uh, you, you'll see those images up here too. You know, it's interesting. They worship John Calvin. And, and that is right. You cannot tell me you didn't hear those, those, those same men. That's worship. Albert Moeller, we have a debt to pay to John Calvin. A debt? I owe some sinning heathen. Some lying false teacher. I owe a debt. Last time I checked, David says, I sin to you, God, and you alone. Last time I checked, we owe God a debt. Who the heck do we owe some useless man a debt of what? To take us into slavery again? It's like owing the Pope a debt. It's no different. Reformed theology ain't, and Protestantism ain't no different than Roman Catholicism. The only real difference is they changed the lash. They're not taking indulgences. They're demanding converts. Reformed theology are not our brothers. There are many of us trapped in it. Oh, yes. And when they come to light, they are then shunned and attacked. 
because they didn't stay the course. It's no different than when Scientology finds those that that speak out against them. They call it squirrel busting. It's no different when Mormons, when somebody comes out of Mormon, oh, they never was one of us. They never believed in Joseph Smith. Same thing with Muslims, except they could be killed. That's what theology and man-made religion can do. It gets to choose who can stay and who can go. As disciples, it is the Holy Spirit that binds us and keeps us. You would think listening to listening to them talking, we owe a debt to John Calvin. You would think that he was somehow great. You know, Jesus actually has something to say about that. And we're going to talk about it. Jesus has something to say about this. Let's read in Matthew 11 7 through 15. Listen to this. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in kings and palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Verse 11, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. For the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. What does that mean? It's what the Roman Catholic Church and Protestantism, the Reformed theology, Mormons, Islam, you name it. They're all trying to lay hold and say, we are the true sons of God. We have a right to preach and teach because we have the kingdom in our possession. They want to tell you how God works. They want to tell you they are the new authority that speaks on high. We speak for God. That's what they want to say. That's what they've been trying to say. And they have killed. Judaism has killed their own prophets. Oh, yes. Remember Stephen? Remember how brutal he was against them, telling them what they've done? Jesus just said the same thing. Peter said the same thing. Men have been trying to kill those that God has sent to speak on his behalf. Those that would beg and plead Repent, for God has chosen a day of judgment. And when that day comes, the blood is now dried up. It's done. And men have been trying to create theologies that turn into religions to where they, they're the keepers of God's glory now. They're the ones, the rightful heirs to speak and preach. They try to steal it from the Israelites. Judaism tries to steal the truth of God so people have to go to them for the truth. Mormons have tried it. Reformed theology have tried it. And all of them has failed. Because we forget about a small little passage that we can read. And we just heard about it. Isaiah 40 verse 3. 
A voice is calling. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. For our God. What else has been done? What else has John done? Oh, what is one of the famous verse that John has done? I know there's I know everybody is very knowledgeable on these things. I would not patronize you to say about it, but let's take a look at some of the verses that speaks on straight paths. Proverbs 3:6. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Who's, who's him? God. And he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Because you know what happens when you do that? The paths ain't straight no more. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That also will keep you on the straight path. Watch the path of your feet. And all your ways will be established. Do not turn to the right nor to the left. Turn your foot from evil. Going down any theological path, that's as broad as they get. Have you ever noticed when things are made by God, they don't splinter? They stay united. There's for every nut, there's a theology for it. The more it agree is agreeable to the sinner, the bigger the theologian gets. Just, just the way it works. Matthew 3.3 3, For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Those straight paths, what John the Baptist did, destroyed every theological foundation that ever could have existed by him preaching that the one that was destined to come has laid waste. John made sure he was crystal clear. John the Baptist was crystal clear. There's only one way for the Lord and it ain't coming through man. It ain't coming through man-made wisdom. It's not coming through man-made devices. It ain't coming through nothing of man. God ensured that by pronouncing Mary righteous and making sure that the king, the savior, the Messiah to the Jews and the savior of all who will believe on his name was not going to be born of men, but was born from God. God has say in everything. Reformed theology, just like any theology, is simply a golden calf modernized. That's all. Theology is an age-old evil. Age-old. Every theologian, and I said it right, every theologian is in the way of Cain. All of them. Every single one of them. Because if you're not in submission to God, if you're not doing as Paul said in, in sorry, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I determined to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. There's no room for anything else. Christ has said it himself. Pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Pick up your cross. There's no room on that cross for theology. There's no, it's barely any room for you. And then we walk down that narrow road, one disciple at a time. That's it. That's all the room that there is. But the Broadway, you can have any theology you want. You can develop it, get on TikTok, make a ministry, become a 5013C. You, you're now, you don't get charged taxes. That's easy. Bubba the love sponge can preach the gospel. He can make it up whatever he wants. And the government will stamp it. And he can go out and build a church. And you can build whatever you want. And not a stitch of it is going to be truth of God. Don't let these men take you captive again. 
They will steal your joy. And every single one of them have a professional noose around their neck. And it's a millstone. And Lord help them as they kill as many souls as they do. Get off that hype train. Those are not men of God. They never have been. And they never will be. If you can accept Reformed theology, you better accept that Mormon because they come from the same master, the devil himself. Control the narrative, you can get the populace. It's always been that way. The devil has been running this narrative since the Garden of Eden. Don't keep falling for his tricks. The best, most charismatic, the most listened to men on this earth are some of the most corrupt, vile theologians you will ever meet. And the good news is, the good news is there's room for more. The bad news is because hell is infinite. I love you very much. Stay tuned for more controlling the narrative. Or we going knee deep. We going out. We go drag all of them into the deep waters and see if they can swim. And I got some. I got some bad news for them. They're drowning. They're drowning. Love you. See you soon.